So uh, here I go. Um, uh, and since this is unlimited, I was um, trying to sort of make a connection with the uh, mathematician in me. I once wanted to become a mathematician. Um, and I was fascinated by this concept, um, Aleph, which is basically infinity in, um, in math uh, language, and it comes out of the theory of sets. So um, Georg Cantor, a, a German uh, mathematician, uh, came up with the evidence that there are different levels of infinity. We tend to think of infinity as something very absolute, um, but based on this theory of sets, he could um, provide evidence that we have levels of infinity, infinities that are more infinite than other infinities. So um, I find this a fascinating concept, and um, I'm sure it's, you know, it's, it's math. Um, it may not be there in the real world. Um, however, we do have in biology sort of a solution for um, this type of uh, affinity. Um, and um, of course, one of the resources that we have that is really infinite, probably one of the only, or maybe the only resource, is uh, imagination. So um, imagination in uh, food, for instance, uh, is, of course, highly regarded. And there are lots of different uh, type of foods. Um, at some point, when I was living in the, in the United States, I thought, well, a steak is more than protein enough. But I saw people eating lobster and steak in one dish. Um, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> that seemed to be a hell of a lot of proteins to me, so I never really tried it. But you can combine these things. And what if you, this is two different tissues, what if you can also produce them in one tissue? Why? What if you can create a woolen rabbit chop or a flaming giraffe um, steak or a mythological uh, hamburger? So our imagination in this regard can be uh, infinitive. Now, um, in biology, we do have a system that uh, promises to be uh, infinite, we have a stem cell uh, in our body, and basically, of course, the fertilized um, uh, uh, ovum is the ultimate stem cell from which we all grow. Um, and the theory about these stem cells is that they can sort of self-renew infinitely and then um, provide a population from which we can regenerate other tissues. Um, and I guess the, the former speaker, Aubrey, is trying to get that to, uh, rea into reality. So why do we have this uh, uh, system? It's, it's basically to, uh, to regenerate ourselves. And can we use that system for other purposes? Now, of course, if it's a solution, you first have to identify the problem. Um, and the problem is basically a, uh, a schnitzel crisis um, that we are uh, facing uh, pretty soon. And it's related to the, um, to the um, inefficiency of animals, of cows in particular, to convert vegetable proteins to animal proteins with a conversion rate, it's going too fast, of only 15%. Uh, so for every um, uh, 15 grams of uh, meat, we have to feed the animal 100 grams of vegetable proteins. So it's an inefficient system. Right now, we are using 70% of all our arable land for um, feeding animals instead of feeding people. And um, what's more, in 2050, the um, uh, demand for meat is going to double. It's going to be um, uh, double what it is right now. And we are simply not capable of producing that kind of meat through livestock. So that will increase uh, the imbalance between uh, demand and supply, of course, raise prices, becomes a scarce luxury item, um, and it also will threaten food security. What's more, what we know by now is that um, livestock actually contributes about 18% um, to all our greenhouse gas emission, uh, giving rise to the expression that a vegetarian with a Hummer is still better for the environment than a meat eater on a bicycle. Um, <laughs> And it's, mostly, and it's mostly methane that they um, uh, excrete. Of course, they actually bulge it. They don't fart it, but I couldn't find a picture of a bulging um, uh, cow. So um, what could be the solution to this problem? How can we get from uh, a boundary of the amount of meat that we can produce to a bounty of meat? And here this stem cell comes into place, because that stem cell is not only sort of in our bone marrow, but every organ actually has a stem cell like this, and every muscle has stem cells. They are 
there are plenty of stem cells waiting there for an injury to happen so that it can repair that uh, tissue. And um, that basically gave a number of people the idea to use this stem cell technology, basically designed in the medical field, um, to produce meat um, in the lab. And that's exactly what we um, started up on. And this is how it works then in real life. You take a small piece of meat from a cow. You extract the stem cells. There are plenty of them in, in even a very small piece of uh, meat. And then um, here you see a couple of those muscles, muscle cells. You also have fat cells, of course. You extract the stem cells. You let them replicate. From a couple of cells, you theoretically can produce 10,000 kilos of meat. Um, so that means that you can take from one cow with probably, I don't know exactly the number of inhabitants in Vienna, but probably you need only 10 cows to feed the entire uh, population here. Um, just taking a couple of samples um, of those uh, animals and, and then replicating the cells. So that's the, the beauty of these um, stem cells. And again, from a couple of cells, you can create 10 tons of meat just through the, the doubling process. Then these particular cells, uh, these particular skeletal muscle um, stem cells need to merge uh, because a, a skeletal muscle cell, which is the basis for our meat, is basically a merged cell of, a, of about 50 other uh, cells. So they need to merge, but the neat thing is if you, if you starve them, they start to do that. So you don't need to do a whole lot of uh, difficult tricks. They just start to merge into this sort of primitive muscle cell. And then the other neat thing is if you provide certain culture conditions where they can attach to something, they will start to self-organize into a muscle fiber. Again, we don't have to do anything particular about it. They, the, these cells do that more or less by themselves. You have to provide the anchoring uh, feature. And uh, in the past, we used Velcro, basically, to do that. Uh, but now we do it a little bit smarter. We let them uh, actually attach to each other in a ring formation around a central hub of gel. And then, uh, because of the tension, they start to contract, they start to build up protein, um, and they start to become a real muscle fiber. Now, if you produce uh, 10,000 of these fibers by hand in the lab, two technicians working for three months full-time on this uh, particular project to make one hamburger, um, 10,000 of these um, fibers constitute uh, approximately one hamburger. And of course, you can also add fat tissue. I will not talk about it, but you can. There's, there's, this is not really a medical technology. There's very little medical need to produce more fat tissue than we already have. Um, but um, the technology is there, and we can use that to grow the fat tissue as well and combine it with muscle tissue in certain, you know, in controllable way to produce that uh, hamburger. And this is then what you get, a hamburger. Now, <clears throat> because there was, um, uh, in the beginning, very little interest in this technology and a lot of skepticism, as you might imagine, we thought, well, what if we just show that we can do this? Uh, we present this hamburger in front of uh, international television. Uh, we find courageous people to eat it in front of the camera. And we actually found um, one of those uh, people here in Vienna. Um, and then that might generate more interest and, uh, so that more people start working on it um, and maybe also people start uh, financing it. So the this is how our version looks like. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the wrong video. Once we started hmm. cooking meat, then we could get okay. lots of energy. This is another explanation of what, what the problem is. Big actually. brains and become physically, anatomically human. Hunters and gatherers all over the world are very sad if, for a few days at a time, the hunters come back empty-handed. The camp becomes quiet, the dancing stops, and then somebody catches some meat, they bring the prey into the camp, or nowadays into somebody's back garden with a barbecue, everybody gets excited to come and share the meat. It is ritually cut and passed out to people. We are a species designed to love meat. Feeding the world is a complex problem. I think people don't yet realize what an impact meat consumption has on the planet. 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from meat production. 
We're also using something like 1,500 gallons of water to produce just one pound of meat. Meat takes up about 70% of our arable lands. There's no question that if we were able to shift more of our land into intensive fruit and vegetable production, we'd be able to feed a lot more people a lot healthier diet. With the global population growing from 7 billion to 9 billion people, by 2050, the demand for meat will double. We can't just continue doing what we've been doing. Unless we make some changes in how we produce meat on this planet, we're in for a terrible reckoning. Meat consumption was part of the human species. It's been fantastically beneficial for us. And now, by some horrendous irony, it's become part of a system that threatens our species. We have to do something about it. Okay, so that's the statement, we are a species designed to eat meat, which is kind of an interesting statement. He is a biological anthropo anthropologist. Um, I don't know exactly what the evidence for it is, but for now, we are actually increasing demand for uh, meat. So in order for this technology to be successful, it first needs to be more efficient than a cow and a cow is very inefficient, as we have seen. The second is it needs to be meat, not a meat replacer. We have meat replacers galore, um, and there's not a very large market for it um, as of yet. So we are really needing meat, supposedly. Um, and um, um, so it needs, to, it needs to fit those two conditions, efficiency and um, uh, mimicry, exactly the same. Now, this is a new technology. It's um, transforming food production from quote unquote sort of a natural state in a cow to something that's performed in a lab by people with white coats and who know what kind of fantasies. Um, so there is a sort of a general, you know, do we actually want this or do we need this? Um, so what's called the uh, sort of the yuck factor. <clears throat> And one of the best outcomes of that presentation that we did with, uh, with the cooking of the hamburger and the eating of the hamburger was that um, it actually created a lot of interest with the public and a poll by The Guardian uh, under um, uh, UK people um, indicated that 68% were willing to try this meat, which was astonishing for us because we thought it would be much more resistant. And in the Netherlands, a um, 60 year old schoolgirl, um, high school girl, actually initiated a survey by a professional survey agency under 15,000 people. Um, also, with the question, would you be willing to eat meat? What do you think about it? And there, 63% said, yes, sure, why not? It's a, it seems like a good idea. So, apparently, we and you are much more adventurous in. Uh, eating new stuff or thinking about new stuff if you see the uh, reason for it. So, um, of course, some of that yuck factor comes from what I said, you know, it becomes sort of technical, it's now in the hands of people, they make mistakes, they may sometimes be fraudulent, so how do we deal with that? Do we really want this? And that's an interesting uh, sort of... Uh, 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 um, that's an interesting um, subject because that's technology versus implementation of technology. So the technology is very simple. You can make meat from stem cells, blah, blah, and then you get a hamburger. Um, the implementation of the technology is how do you actually get that into society? Do you let multinationals produce this? Or can you do this in a much more sort of controlled way? Um, so as a, uh, again, also a thought experiment, we said, well, could you do this at home? And uh, yes, you can. These, um, these stem cells do survive freeze drying, so you could envision that eventually you order them over the internet, you order a bag of salmon stem cells or tuna stem cells or um, uh, bovine stem cells or whatever, and do this in your own kitchen. Now, this is the kitchen of the future, um, especially in an urban environment where you have your garden more or less in your kitchen because there's no place uh, anywhere else. Um, and there you would have this little incubator with your um, uh, meat production in between the kitchen and your bread maker uh, where you make your own bread. Um, it's a very nice idea. It's a little bit complex because you need to know about eight, nine weeks in advance what you want to eat, but it's... Um, <laughs> just to make you think about distinguishing the technology from how you implement it. 
You could also design other ways to do this in a community where, for instance, in, in, a, in a neighborhood in, in Vienna, you have uh, two cows and uh, three pigs, and you tend to that um, flock with the community. You once in a while stick a needle in their butt, um, take the stem cells out, and in a local small factory in the, in the in the garage of somebody in the neighborhood, you produce all the meat for, for the neighborhood, which would also reconnect you to the origin of meat. So there are all sorts of fantasies um, how you could eventually implement this in society, um, taking away that fear from bet in between technology and how it's going to be uh, implemented. Okay, so then, and then um, we sort of became a little bit more adventurous because we thought, well, if, if the people actually accept the, the common idea, then we can um, imagine what you could do with this technology. And once you have uh, accepted it, you can actually do a lot with it. You can make all these funny sort of products. Um, and um, you could also envision that you change the, at least uh, the biochemistry of the, um, uh, especially the fat cells a little bit so that they more, make more uh, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. In fact, we know that the um, fat cells from cows can do that. When you have grazing cows, they already produce more omega-3 and omega-3 fat fatty acids than, um, uh, than when you feed them uh, uh, feed. So you can create hamburgers or other pieces of meat with um, which with fats that actually lower your cholesterol. So you can envision that at some point your general pr practitioner actually prescribes you uh, two hamburgers a week. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the real goal here is to uh, eventually get plenty of meat so that we can all keep on uh, eating meat, um, that it requires much less resources than it does right now, um, it has been calculated that with this technology you could reduce the amount of land by 90%, water 90%, energy 70%. So with much less resources you can provide sufficient meat for the uh, community and also the growing community. And that I think is very important to, uh, uh, to do because one of my biggest fears is that if that becomes a scarce um, item, meat, then it will be an incentive for companies to produce more and more, and then this inefficient food conversion sort of uh, plays against us because we will end up um, feeding animals instead of uh, people. So the aim of this is to uh, keep on uh, eating meat and provide with this technology a bounty of it. Thank you. <laughs>